Uh, okay. Um, so this is the main program. Um, and there is a main object that is used to control everything and it's called uh, queue application. And queue application is, is an object that um, kind of is the master of everything. So it, it, it um, knows how to interact with the system. It knows, um, owns all the controls and windows in an application. Uh, so, so this is the first thing you have to do is create your application object. The next step is you have to create your um, user interface objects. So in this case, uh, the main class for the user interface is a widget. Uh, and, and the widget can be shown. So the next step is to show your widget. And the final step is to go into the application loop. An application loop is contained in this command or this uh, statement here. App exec will start the application loop and start running it. And when it terminates, it will return uh, an exit code. And this here is the termination command of, of a Python script. So basically, your curve starts, and it will it, it will kind of uh, go around here in this, this event loop here, and spin there until your application, the last window, terminates, and it will exit. And I will show you how this can look. So uh, this is our uh, main application here again. And um, if I run this, I get a window on the screen. So the application object is responsible for kind of uh, dispatching all the system messages to our different widgets and controls. So if a widget um, is not a window, it will be um, added there, you, you will get window control on top of it. So it, this, this here will be added automatically. And already now, without writing much code, you can resize your window, you can move it around on the screen. Uh, and when you exit, the, close the window, you will see on the, on the lower side here that it will exit um, here. It exited now. So, so when, when I close the window, it, it, it closed the program and it exited the loop. You will get uh, all, all of these files are available to, to download and experiment yourself. So the base clause for all of the widgets or user interface objects in Qt is the Q widget clause. Uh, and the Q, and Q widget can contain uh, other user interface objects. So you can add like a list of objects to this uh, widget. Um, if it doesn't have a parent, it will create an outer window to, to show it on the screen. Uh, and what you also usually do is that you derive uh, a custom application window from Q widget. Um, so you, you uh, so, so that you have your own window class and your own methods and you add that to, and, and that, that you derive from all the base functionality you derive from the Q widget um, class. So in this case here, um, this is the my window. Um, I create my own class here, and I derive that from Q, uh, from Q widget. Uh, I uh, initialize uh, call the constructor for for the Q widget control here. I usually uh, put all my uh, user interface code in in a separate routine like this. So init GUI, which is here. Uh, here, I, here I set all the properties I need for my user interface. In this case, it's very simple. I just have a, a method for setting the geometry, which is the size of the window. Uh, I use the window title here. So usually you have a, I have a question here about the window exiting. So usually have a, a main window that is uh, that owns all the other so you have a main window that owns your own child windows and it's only when the the last main window closes that you exit your loop 
Um, so also you don't have to kind of add the windows to. So when you create a window or widget, it will automatically be added to the system. So uh, the application object knows about them and knows when there are no windows anymore. Um, I hope that answered the questions, Christian. Okay. So let's see here, uh, this will... So now I have a, my own wind, window here, uh, in my own class, I have an init GUI. This here, this says the geometry, which is uh, uh, the position X, Y, and the width and height of the window. This is the title. And then you, um, finally, you m must call self.show to enable the widget to be displayed on the screen. So if I run this here now, now I have a, the only difference from the last example is I have a title set here. And you can see here that it come, came up on about 300 by 300 pixels. And it has a size of 600 by 600. And here, the difference also is in the, in the main program here. Here we instantiate our own clause here instead of the widget clause here. So user interface controls. Uh, so it's, it's not so funny to have a empty window. So we need to fill it with, with stuff. And uh, there are a multitude of controls. I will go through those later, uh, one by one. One, one obvious one is, is, a, is a button that you can press. And this is a Q push button, uh, is the class for, for a, a button. And here you can see you add your controls. Uh, you create a new Python object. Here is the push button. Assign it to self here so that your own window keeps track of that button. Uh, the first parameter here is the, the, the caption of the button, so the, the button you have pressed. And then self here uh, assigns it that it should be owned by the, the main window Q widget. So I will, I will uh, in this PowerPoint, there is a link to all the documentation for all these uh, uh, widgets. So uh, I, I, uh, you, can, you can find it there. Uh, and then you can set uh, properties here so you can resize the widget, you can move the widget. And I will go through all these uh, later on. So if I run this here, I have my button here. And you see here now, now I have a control here, which I, I created. Um, so now it shows, so it, Resize sets the size of the control and move will position it at 50 by 50 here. And, and the coordinate system for all of the widgets are uh, zero, zero is up in the top left corner going down. So positive axis down and right. So it's not enough to have, have your uh, controls just lying on a window. You need to kind of make it make something happen when the users press and interact with your controls. So uh, um, and all controls or, uh, in, in Qt has uh, something called signals that em are emitted when you press them or you interact with them in some sense. And, and, and a single controller can have multiple signals that are going out from that control. And to be able to kind of connect those signals to your code, you need to connect uh, the signal with your code. So you can see here that I have a, uh, well, for the button, for example, there is a clicked signal, there is a press signal when the button is held down. And for a list box, for example, there is a current row change here, which is a signal that sends out when you, when you some, a row in a list is changed. And the connection is made by a special method called connect. So if you have a, a clicked um, signal, there is a dot connect method on that, which you can assign your own method here. So the self on my button clicked is, a, uh, is your own code. 
So in your main window, you add a method called on my button clicked, and then you connect it with the connect method. And here, here is the information and documentation here, uh, all the widgets here for Qt. Um, and the, the, problem, the problem is that m there is no good documentation for Python, but the, the, um, the C++ documentation is, is very readable and you can translate the, me the method calls and the signals quite easily to Python. So let's see, I have EX4. So in this example here, uh, I have my button uh, which we created previously here. Uh, and then I have a uh, next step here, I have my self button dot click connect. This is what I do to connect my, my button to uh, my own code here. So in basically this connects to this method here on button clicked. So if we run this example now, it should display hello in my lower right console window. So let's see here. So when I press, you will see here that it prints out hello here. So now I have a connection between an, a signal going from my window to my own code. And this is the basic principle that we are going to use when we uh, build a user interface. We create our controls in some ways, we connect them to our code. And uh, this is a bit unusual when you're programming normal code like MATLAB, uh, because the, the control, the, the code flow um, is not from one point to another point. This is, um, the user can push any button in any, any order, in any kind of way. And it's up to you as a programmer to make sure that uh, you check for all the things that you need to check for before before actually doing stuff. For example, if you have a user that hasn't saved the file and he wants to open a new file, you have to check to make sure that do you really want to don't you want to save this file before opening a new one? You have to kind of be defensive, more defensive in your in your programming style, because the user can press anything in any direction. And it can also be important to hide, to disable some of the controls so the user can't. Uh, do stuff when when you're at a certain point in your in your code. So if the user uh, hasn't run the calculation, you can't show the visualization. So you have to kind of be defensive in your program. So common control properties that uh, is uh, you need to know is uh, like I said to be able to control what's possible or not. There are some uh, basic uh, methods that you can use to control uh, how you can users can interact with controls. So you, you can have set visible, uh, which basically turns on or off a, a control. So if you set set visible to false, the control disappears from the window. It's still there, invisible, but the user can't interact. We can't see the control. You can check the status using the is visible method. You can check if it's active. So set enabled false will enable will disable the control, but it's still visible on the screen. Is enabled, you can check that. And set enabled true, it will be activated again. Certain controls uh, can also have a focus. So if you have multiple text controls in a window, only one of those can have the cursor at the same time. And then when you put set focus, you can actually move your focus around the controls to set the cursor where the cursor is active at, uh, at, at a certain point of time. You can set fonts, you can set the text is also usually, uh, the text of a control is uh, used by a set text method and you retrieve it by using the dot text method. Here can you also see the inheritance of C++ because this, um, all the methods are uh, using the same notation as the C++ method. So, in this case, set visible with an uppercase B, that is typically a C++ notation. So in this case, this for example here, I will show some of these uh, methods for controlling visibility and uh, enable controls. So I create three buttons. So uh, one, two, and three. Uh, I connect two of them to uh, uh, this one here, and I connect one to
this control here. And on the first event method, I will set the visible uh, flag to the control. So I will turn it on and off. Uh, I also uh, want to have a enable disable one of the controls. So I use the uh, set enables true or false here. So now I have a window here with three buttons. So if I press the first button, it will uh, set button two to be invisible. So if I click here, you see the button will disappear. That means that is the same as saying the visible is false. If I press it again, it will be visible again. If I press button three, it will, let's see. No, sorry, if I press button two, it will disable button three. So now you see here, the, the button is still there, but I can't interact with it. And now I can interact with it again. Press again, it will disable it again. So enable is a, a way of visually telling the user this control is not active yet. I have a question here about the default size and settings uh, positions. So there is a default size for everything. So a button will have a default size, but not the position. So you always have to specify position um, unless we have, I'll get back to layout controls later, but in this right now, you always have to set the position. We can, I can show you this if I just do like um, this here. You see here, there is a default size of these, and then they will also adapt to the text you have set on it. So they will have a fixed uh, vertical size, but uh, elastic um, width. And I show already how you connect the event using the connect method, so I can skip that. Uh, you can also, uh, change the way windows uh, are, are uh, appears on the screen. So uh, in windows, you have the standard windows uh, and also Mac standard windows layout. In some, some cases you, you need a smaller header on, on or top of the window, for example, that should emulate the tool window or something like that. And that is uh, controlled by using special style options that you can provide to your dialog. So let's see here if I open. So here, I, this is just a normal window style here, QT window. If I run this, it will look like a standard window like this. If I turn that out and I use this one instead. Now it will look like a dialog window and dialog windows are usually uh, you can, they can be scalable, but you don't have a maximize window and there is a, a help button here as well. And there's also a way of have it, having it look like a tool window. There we go. Oh, no, it didn't. Okay, my program has stopped here. Oh, let's see here.
worked. Let's see how. Okay, now it works. So tool window, a smaller uh, bar here, uh, and a smaller button here. So in some some in many programs, you can see these as kind of tool palettes floating around on the window with a lot of small controls in them. Uh, another control, um, you can also run your applications maximized and then you can you can control that by using the, sit, oh, the set window state. And we can see here, we can do window maximized. Know why they stop working here? Um, try. So now I have a window that is to cover the entire screen. And there's also one way of, if you, if you want an application that will cover the entire screen uh, and uh, don't have any decorations like uh, close buttons or stuff like that, uh, you can have QT full screen as well. So let's see if I can get it to work here now. And now you see here you have a completely white window and you have to exit using Alt F4 to kind of close the window because you don't have any controls to interact with this one. So, uh, menus and toolbars are an important way of interacting with an application. So on a Mac, you have your menus on the top of the screen. Uh, on, on a Windows uh, application, you usually have them inside your window. Uh, and toolbar is the same thing. You have a on a Mac, you have them and, um, sometimes on the top, and sometimes you have them in the windows as well. But um, and uh, those are important things that those are kind of the bread and butter of user interface con con controls. And in in, in uh, Qt, most of the functionality is controlled using the Q menu bar uh, class, which kind of is the main uh, owner of all the menus uh, in your application. And every menu item is associated with something called a queue action, which is what's going to happen when you actually execute or select a menu or a toolbar. And the reason we have action is that usually toolbars and menus are kind of interconnected. So menus, the menu items are often also available on the toolbars. And to be able to, to uh, minimize the code you have to write, so instead of writing one event method for menu and for toolbar, you create one action object that you connect to both of them. So that the action is a, is a generic connection between the, with, uh, in the user interface uh, from a menu or a toolbar. And also the action also contains um, icons and shortcuts, the uh, keyboard shortcuts that you want for that uh, action. And also the events are connected to the actions instead of the controls directly. So compared to a button, button you, the menu is connected, uh, the event for what's going to happen is not connected to the menu object, but to the action object. So this is the code for uh, creating a menu. So the first thing we do is we, we uh, define the actions that wants, that should happen. So you have uh, my action here. I have a shortcut here. This is a keyboard shortcut. Uh, and then we have my action, there is a special signal called triggered, which you connect to your own method here. So down here we have my, my action object here. Uh, and then you add it to the menu bar here. So I, I create a, a file menu here, self menu bar, add menu file, but then you add action to this menu bar. And we are also, using a special, we are not using widget anymore, we're using a main window here. And main window class 
uh, owns a main menu and uh, also uh, so it can display a menu. So normal windows, they don't have a, a default control main window here. Um, so for uh, the, I have a question here about the, the, the running loop for this example. So you don't have to do anything special on, on the main loop. So the main loop will execute all the time and, and uh, we call the, 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 menu, the actions, so the method that you get associated with action automatically. So usually you don't have to change anything special in your main loop to uh, handle win, uh, different uh, actions and stuff like that. But, but the, I can show you the, how the code looks like in, um, in Spider. So So probably this here. So I have my window here. It's the same as before. The only thing I've changed is the few main window up here. Uh, that enables you to to have a to use the menu bar function here down below. So now I have a window here, and you have a main menu here. Also, you see here that there is control T, uh, which uh, you can use as a shortcut for, from the keyboard. So if I check here, it will call my method here in my own menu action here. So the, 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 the order is that you create an action or multiple actions, you create the menus, and then you add your actions to the menu or toolbars later on as well. So toolbars is handled basically in the same way as menus. So you add a toolbar using the self.add toolbar, uh, and then you can add an action to a toolbar. So here I have uh, my action here, same. I have a, my add my action to the menu and I add my action to a toolbar. So now I have my menu, my action. I also have my action here on the toolbar. So both of these will call this method here because I only have one action defined and it's on the action I add the triggered here, the connection here. So this is the action that actually calls my, my, my method later on. So as you have seen in the previous example here, I used uh, absolute positioning and uh, that means that I put the control on in a coordinate system um, and I, I used to do that for all the controls. This can be quite uh, hard to do um, if you have a lot of controls, you have to position them exactly. So Qt also supports uh, uh, layout management or it can manage your controls for you automatically and place them and, and move them if the window resizes. Uh, and and uh, you have different layout manager that that handles uh, um, that that can hand, that can organize controls in different ways. So the simplest example is uh, the virtual virtual the vertical box layout, and that means that it's a it's a layout manager that handles controls in a vertical orientation. So you can create a lot of push buttons put them into this uh, layout, and then they will be automatically organized. Let's see here. My question from Sora here. Let's see here. Yes, so the main application loop will check for the events, and 
send the signals where you have connected signals. So, uh, but so you don't have to update your loop. It will automatically be handled. If you do a connection, it will be the signals will be sent to that uh, destination. Now the, the loop is contained in the exec method. So. Uh, um, So let's try this one here. This is the VBOX size, for example. So I, I just create uh, four buttons here. I just add them to the to the QVBOX layout. So the QVBOX layout actually uh, uh, forms like a normal control itself. So uh, I, I can set that as the main the layout here of the of the of your of my main widget, uh, and it will take up the entire window. So let's see what happens if I run this here. So now you see here I have four buttons and, and this control organizes them in a vertical order. So if I resize my window, it will resize my buttons automatically. It will also resize them uh, horizontally like this. Uh, there is also a corresponding horizontal box sizer, which is the opposite. It, it organizes controls uh, in a horizontal way. So let's see here if I have that one here. So now you see here the buttons are organized in a horizontal way instead, but they are still. So the, the, the sizer is takes up the entire window and it just stacks them uh, to the right here. Uh, so you need also, I mean, you can combine these here. So you can have uh, multiple sizes organized in different ways. So in this case here, I have uh, four buttons. Uh, first, I have uh, I have first a pair of buttons, uh, four buttons here, and, uh, and another pair of four buttons here. Uh, and I add them to the uh, have an outer uh, vertical layout here. So this is a V box. And then I have a, a horizontal box in this direction here. Okay, let's see. I don't like this. The drawing doesn't work too well. So here I have a this this is a Sorry. Uh, here the controls are organized in a horizontal way. Then you combine them together. Then you can also put the spring here in between to kind of make sure that those controls stay on the top side and the other ones are, are pressed down. So here you have, first you create your, all your controls here and then you add the first fourth in a vertical layout like this, and then I, I put create a horizontal layout like this, add a stretch to the to the vertical box and add an add a layout, the H box into the V box layout here. And then I set the V box at outer layout control. It takes some to get get used to this so um, uh, you have to kind of practice here. Here you see that you have uh, those will always stay on the top because here is an invisible spring that presses outwards uh, here. We press those controls uh, apart. And here I also added a, a stretch here in between here. Like that. Um, I think we should do a, a 10 minute break here and then I will uh, go through the controls um, and uh, also um, introduce you to uh, something called QT Designer which make this much easier. So we will take a short break.
You don't have to do your own dialogues for uh, selecting and opening files. Those, those are available uh, in the system directly. Uh, controls. So now I just go through the different controls that you can use to build your user interfaces from. So you can have uh, buttons with state. So, um, you know, so the radio, the checkbox and radio button, th those are uh, uh, special bu specialized button that can have a kind of state. So uh, the checkbox, for example, can have on off. Uh, the radio button can be a selection from a group. Um, and they're all they're, they're controlled basically in the same way. So you have set check state, you can query with check state. With the radio button, you, you query with, with set checked and is checked. And uh, they are controlled, they're created in the same way as buttons. The only thing that they have additional properties. Uh, here you have set check to set to set uh, control to true here. And you can also set uh, connected to set uh, state change connect. So it, it will trigger an event when you click check the box. The radio button, the same thing here. Radio buttons is a special checkbox that uh, only one of the buttons can be checked at the same time. So in this case, I have two radio buttons and only one of them can have the checked uh, state at the same time. It has the same kind of uh, controls that the, the checkbox has. Let's see here, checkbox. So now I see here, there's, this is a standard Windows. And we have a radio box. So now you see here, only one of these can be selected at the same time. If you have, if you want to have multiple of these uh, choices, you need to group them together. So uh, uh, you put two, three, or four of these radio buttons in one group, three or four in the ne next group, and only only one of them in each group can be selected. So if you only create, um, if you, if you just put them on the on the screen, only one of them will be active at the same time. So if you want to have multiple uh, radio box groups, you need to group them together to enable the same functionality. A combo box is a special selection box that, uh, where you can provide a user with a drop down list where you can select different things. It can also have a text box with predefined options. And it's usually used when you, you have a limited amount of space and you, don't, can, you can't fit all the, all the options in, in, in a single window, then you can have them hidden and then drop down when you want the user to select them. And there is a signal called current item change, which you can connect uh, to event to kind of check for when, when user click in this. There is a, a method called current index, which returns the currently selected item. Uh, so this is a combo box control. Uh, you add items to them using the add items method here. Uh, and then you can, you can pre-select using the set current index here. Uh, and then you can connect the current index change signal to your own method here to check what you actually selected. Let's see here, uh, combo box. So you can see here that this is a very compact control. You can click on it here and you see you get all the all options you can select. And it said you just shows one and then you can also get a text from it. So you have a, a current text here, which is the selected text you have in your, in your combo box. And from the um, item, the change here, you get also the index here in your method. So this is the currently selected item in your combo box. Slider is a way of uh, the user entering uh, numbers uh, without typing any in the values, and you can you can set the ranges and the step size in different way in different ways. Uh, you can have vertical sliders and you can have uh, horizontal sliders. Uh, so here you create them here 
you can set the maximum value, you can set the minimum value, and you can set the, the current value. So these are, so I have one vertical and one horizontal here. Uh, and then there's also a signal called value changed, which uh, is called every time the value of the slider changes. So here I have my two sliders. I connect value changed to my own method here on value changed. And I print out the value for each time it's changed here. So let's see here. You see here, if I drag them back and forth, they change value and the method is called all the time. You can also see here, it's, it's, it's possible to uh, connect signals, two signals to one, one single method as well. So you don't have to have one uh, event method for every, uh, for every signal. You can, you can actually connect them together to respond similar, similar events to, to one single event method. This box is very similar to a combo box, but it shows you the actual items you can select in, in a list. Uh, and you can also see there, if you have more items than there's possible to fit in the list box, it will add a scroll bars as needed. A list box, can also, you can also have multiple selection in a list box. So this is uh, how it can look like. So here you uh, uh, create the box and you can add I items to the box here using the add item method. Uh, you can set the current row like in the combo box and you have a signal called current row change that you can handle when, use, when a user selects different parts of the combo box or the list box. Now let's see the list box. So you can see here, it, it, this is the index I chose, and this is the text that the current item in the list box contains. So this is controlled if you want to, do, to display actively on, on your window what, what options are available, uh, and you have space to do that, the list box is a way of doing it. Line edit is a, also a very common controls for entering values. So the text box, you have seen them multiple times in the in user uh, or in, in user interfaces, uh, where you can put your cursor and enter a value. So the position of the controls is always on the, on the top left when you insert things. Uh, and also the, the, the method to, to set the text in a line edit is the set text method and also using a text. So here I have my line edit. Uh, this is a top left position you see here, 50-50 is this position here. And then the, re the size is uh, this one. This here and this here. Uh, the line edit here is uh, you set the text here. Let's see where we just found this here. So here I can just enter values or text, and then I can display it, uh, what is inside is using a, the text method to. Uh, here I just self line edit text will return the text uh, and it displayed in an information box. Uh, so just to uh, give an how to kind of uh, approach uh, creating user interfaces. So I have a, a, a kind of um, very I have a good uh, rule I, I work with is that I, I always try to not mix user interface code with simulation model code. It's kind of tempting to to uh, put all your uh, simulation and calculation code in, inside the user interface methods, but 
at some point you probably perhaps would want to change the user interface. Uh, and then it's very hard to kind of extract all that code from your uh, user interface code. So what I try to do is I put everything that has to do with my computation model in a special class, uh, which I import into my user interface classes. So I, I only access my model through methods and properties and so on. Um, and it's also the way you kind of consistently can, by having this model, you can uh, uh, more easily make it more consistent how you update your model and, and vice versa. So usually I have um, two kind of methods for handling this. So I have one method for taking my, my, my values from my model and, and populating my controls. And then I have another model called update, other method called update model, which kind of takes the values from the controls and updates my models. Uh, and also, we already probably already started to implement saving and loading of models, and those can be reused for, for the user interface. So instead of writing all the save code in my uh, method for when I save, my event method for saving, I just call my model and ask it to save it to a specific file name. Um, I have a question on how to how to do this import. So I will uh, go through uh, a complete example for this. So um, how I, I think and how to use this. And also the, the project is kind of designed in that way. So it should have the same kind of uh, ideas. So this is a very simple model. So I have a, this is even not a calculation model. I have a, um, some values that this part of my model, for example, uh, the 42, an option true, false, alternative, value 84. Uh, I have a print routine, for example, printing out these things. I have a user interface that should display those things. And then I have uh, two uh, methods for kind of populating. So update controls will take uh, the values from the model. So the values from the models is here and I populate my user interface with those. Uh, and then I ha also have a other way around. So when, when the user is finished with the uh, updating controls, pressing okay, for example, then we do the other way around. So then we assign our model properties or values uh, from the controls. So from a single point in my, my, my uh, user interface, I kind of have two Way so one going to the controls and one from the from the controls to the model. So to kind of show this in a complete example, I, I created a simply supported uh, Beam example here, and you will get that code from me. Uh, you can it's already available on the web pages and Canvas. Uh, so this is just a very simple Beam theory example. Um, and the idea is uh, the model um, is, uh, should. The idea is to use the model is like this. So I, I create my uh, model object, and I can set my properties here: a, b, p, uh, elastic modulus, uh, moment of inertia. I just assign those to the model, and I now I want just want to print them out just to illustrate how to use it. There are uh, methods called v, v, and to get, get the um, um, section forces and moments uh, at a certain uh, position of the beam. So if I look at the class constructor for this, this looks like this. Um, here I also use hidden properties here. So th these are my, my uh, hidden member variables. So the, the user can't access them directly. I also have a special one called L, which is calculates the total length of the beam. Uh, then also to be able to handle uh, floating point conversions in, in, a, in a nice way, without any errors, I have a two float, which takes a, um, tries to do a, a sign a new value. And, and I also have a, a second parameter here, which is the old value. Uh, and this is the new values are going in. So and then I have a, a try here to try to convert to a floating point. If I get a value error, I will return the old value. So if the user does something wrong, 
um, this one will always return the old value. So you can you can kind of silently fail the conversion here. And then I, I add my uh, get set method for my properties. So basically just uh, return A if I get A and so on. And I will set my, and here are the properties. So I have one method for each property, get A, set A, get B, set B. And I have also get length here, which is a read only property. So it will only read, you can always read length. You can't set the length because that's depending on A and B. And then I have some methods here for calculating the section, the, the deflection, uh, the section forces, and the moment moments at a certain position of the beam. So now I've completed. Now I have, have a model. So now I want to do a user interface for this. So the idea here is to create something like this. My input variables here, and every time I change the input value, it will update. The the, uh, the, control, the the list here, so it will automatically change the, the, the table here. So this is the way, uh, so now I, the model is kind of self-contained. There is no connection to any user interface in this case. So now I want to use this from my, my beam window, which is my main user interface class. Uh, and then I import my model like this. So now I have B model uh, as BM, similar to what you do with the uh, importing CalFem and, and stuff like that. And the first thing I do in my constructor is I create a beam object here. So now my, my user interface own an instance, a uh, beam uh, simply supported uh, class instance or object. So now it, it has to, uh, it can use that to calculate everything. And then I, I initialize my GUI, create all my controls. And then I connect every time you, uh, there is a special uh, signal called editing finish. When a text control has uh, finished editing, it will, it can emit a signal that is editing is finished. And then I call an, a special method for, for uh, convert, you know, for, for handling that. So in this case here, I have a, a Update controls that will take my uh, the control the values uh, from the model and assign them to controls. And then I have an update text edit here, which is used to create a table and add stuff to the tape to the to this uh, text control. And then I have an update model, which goes this other way around. It goes from beam A, oh, sorry, the controls to the model properties. And then I have a uh, uh, update controls uh, to make sure the, uh, the values are reflects the model, and then I update model, and then update text edit. So let's see here. Um, I have the example here. Uh, so this is the finished program beam model. Uh, looks like this. And here you see one use of this using the main here. So if I run this standalone, it will just produce a text table here in my console window here. So I can run this as a, as a standalone program. Then I have a beam user interface with my beam window class here. So if I run this, I get a window like this. And now you see if I change something here to one, it will automatically update the table where every time I, I switch from different controls, uh, I can, I can, uh, it will update the, the table here. Okay, I will go back here and, and repeat here. So, so I tried, to, I mean, you have to go, you have a user interface part and you have a control part. So you need to, uh, at some point, uh, populate your controls with values from the model. So in this case here, I have uh, update controls. We'll, we'll use the set text method of the controls and convert the values of the model here 
to the controls. And then you also have another way around. Uh, so suppose you have changed your values in the controls. You need to assign your model values here, your control values, those are here. So then you're going the other way around like this. And then when, when the text has or any values have changed, I need to kind of recalculate the table again. And this is the, this is the way I, I recalculate the table. And that is called from, see here, on editing finished, we'll call this, um, this update text here. So this is on editing finish. So when users has have entered a text in the text box, uh, switch to another text box, on editing finish is called on that text box. And then I update the controls. I make sure that they, they have the correct values. I update the model with the correct values. And then I update the text edit here again. Here, how does uh... oh, it seems my slides are wrong? Oh, oh. yeah. So okay. So when when you have edited the text, the first thing that happens is is this here. I don't know why uh, it was wrong. This here update model. That means I, I will take all the control values and and, and uh, update my model values with the controls. Then I will update the, the text control here with the table, and then I will update the controls again. I can see if I do this, um, add a print statement here. So if you see here, the first thing that happens is update controls is called to kind of uh, take the values, default values as part of the model. Uh, and then um, make sure that there are values in the controls. Yes. Yeah, so, so w w when I, uh, when I, enter something in my controls here. So for example, 1.2, you see here, it will update the model. So it will uh, get the values from the controls, update the values in the model, uh, and then it will again update the controls, make sure that we have the correct values in the controls. So it, it's done after the editing. So you see here, everything I, I edit here, it will kind of do the same thing again to make sure that we always have the wrong uh, the values here. And if I try to enter something that is not invalid or not correct, it will put the value back again with the, the, the lost value. Um, I hope it didn't be, well, it was completely confusing here. Uh, the thing is I have something that is it's wrong here, it should be, we'll fix this directly here. So that was um, the idea. So, so, but, but the base idea I want to take home that you should take home is that um, separate the user interface from the model. So have all your, your stuff that is ha from the computation model separate from the user interface. Uh, just call into your uh, model and 
call back and, and get your properties and fill your control. So as little as possible of your model code should be in the user interface. So that is the main thing to, to take back. Uh, the final part here, uh, which is also available in a, in a separate video, is how to use something called the Qt Designer. So as I said, it's really hard to do the user interfaces manually. So now at the end here, I will show you something that makes this, this really much simpler. So, uh, so the user interface I showed up to now is basically one, two, three, ten controls. If you have a, a real large user interface, you will have hundreds of hundreds of controls sorted in different toolboxes, menus, and stuff like that. And it's really hard to do that in directly in the source code. Um, and it's much easier to do that in, in, a, in a graphical tool that you can kind of uh, change and move uh, visually uh, the, the user interface. And fortunately, the Qt supports a special XML format, text-based format, to describe user interfaces. And those are stored in special UI files. And with UI, the UI files, you can ask Qt to load the UI files and create all the objects for you automatically. Uh, and, and the application to do this is called Qt Designer, and you can access that from your uh, Anaconda installation. So the idea is to, in this case here, uh, you add an import statement here, uh, PyQt import UIC, which is a user interface compiler uh, reader. And then instead of creating all your user interface code, you just do this. So you load a file from disk in the same runtime directory where you have your code. Uh, you just load this file and it will automatically create every object in that user interface for you. You don't have to do any single line of code. The only thing you have to do is uh, connect your code and, and uh, set the text properties and stuff like that from your own code. But the entire user interface is, will be defined for you. So to show this, I will uh, illustrate how this can be done. So um, you can, um, the designer can be started uh, from uh, Anaconda command prompt. So you just uh, type designer. That should bring up a window shortly, I think, yes. Um, so I will we'll create a very simple example here. So here you can create uh, different kind of uh, user interfaces as a template here. So you have a dialogue, you have a main window, uh, and a widget. So if you want to create something with main, uh, uh, with menus and toolbars, you should start with the, Q main, the, the main window. Uh, if you want to just have a generic window without the menu, you can use widget here. So I, I will try to use the, the, the simple widget here. So the, the idea I want to create now, hopefully I can manage to do this in time. I will try to do this. So I want to create a user interface that has a, a text editor in the middle. So this will be text control here. So I will use a Q text browser here. Then I want to have a buttons here on the right side. And I want to have buttons on the, on the left side and perhaps two buttons down here. So if I look at this, this uh, user interface, 
it can be organized um, something like uh, um, So you can see here, you have uh, some kind of vertical layout here in this control here. You have a vertical layout this control here. And in this here, you have a horizontal layout. And here you also have a horizontal layout in this here. So I will try to uh, create the controls and then try to group them and, and create something that looks very similar to this. So we just start uh, by adding some buttons here. And on the left side, left side of the screen, you have a tool palette here. So uh, here you have uh, tools or widgets, which you can select from. Uh, on the right side, you have uh, And on the right side, you have uh, on top here, you have your object structure here, and then you have properties here, uh, which control the, the, the appearance of the different controls. So to add controls, you just drag them over to your window here. So I just drag a couple of buttons like this, and then I drag some so my, usually when I use this, I, I, I try to kind of approximately get my controls right. Uh, don't bother so much with the vertical layouts yet, just yet, just kind of uh, add them to my window like this. And then I need a um, text browser like that. Need some more buttons here underneath here. So, so, the, so now I have a, a very ugly user interface. So the first thing I will do is kind of group the controls that should be grouped. So in this case here, these buttons here belong together. So I just mark them like this. And then I, on top of the screen here, I can lay out vertically. So I click here and you see here, these are organized vertically. I do same thing with this one here, organize vertically. And these ones here, I organize horizontally. And then you can see you have, I have basically three columns here. One, two, three. So I can organize all of these here together uh, horizontally like this. And then I, I can organize these two together vertically. So let's see here. Um, this one here and this one here. So, but the problem is now it doesn't fill up the screen because the main window doesn't have any uh, layout manager set to it. So, and it doesn't actually matter what you have on the, uh, on, on the top thing here. So you can just put like this and you see here it fills up the entire window. The problem is that now it is kind of a bit ugly. I want the, the buttons on the left side to be on the top, the same thing on the right side. <coughs> what you can do then is to use uh, the springs here or a vertical spacers. So I can drag a vertical spacer and I can add it to the top bottom of my uh, uh, left button group here. And I release it and all of a sudden it just connects together and uh, becomes a that presses the button on, on the top here. I do the same thing on the on the right side here, like that. And then I want to have my buttons, buttons to be centered here in the middle. And I put the horizontal spacer here. I have to kind of 
make sure I, I hit them correctly here like that. And then I go on the other side and I try to get them like that. Um, I can also, if I want to have a button on the right side, I can move this one here between the buttons here. And you see here, this one will be pushed on the right side here. So if I'm, I'm happy now, I can uh, save it directly here. But something you, you need to, it's important to do is, is to give your controls proper names. So if I want to change, for example, my push button here to something else, uh, you have an object name here in the, in the right side of the properties. This is the name you will get in Python as well. So it's important that you give your controls reasonable names that you can find them again. So I can do a press me button here. And then I also want to change my, the text that is in the button here. So press me like this. So now you see that the, the button changed to press me and this one. And then you can go through all of your controls to give them sensible names. When you're done, you save this. Now let's see here if I can uh, go into my code UI and I create form file of UI. So now I save my, my file as uh, my uh, user interface design as form file.ui. And then I go back to spider, open my forms um, here. And now I change my form four to form five. Now I run my program again. Okay, so now you see here, I tried to access a button that didn't exist. So push button is not available in the UI file, but however, I put a press me button instead. That should work. And you see here, I have created a user interface. And this is uh, hopefully a much easier way of doing it than doing it everything manually and adding stuff to the, to the source code. And you also see here that I, I, I called set text on my button here and it changed the text on my button here. And you can also do, for example, F1, Self press me dot clicked dot connect. You see here that it will respond to my events. And if you if you open a file like this, so if we go into the uh, the UI file, you see here, this is the, what the file consists of. So this, this kind of defines the entire user interface uh, for you. And then your, uh, this command here will load it and assign all the objects to the self here, which is my window here. So all the objects will be available to me uh, as, as you have created them yourself. Run this here. Um, I have a question about rescaling here. So, uh, if the, this middle part would be a graph uh, and it resize the window, uh, that graph window will also rescale. So, uh, for example, if we are going to use matplotlib, and uh, matplotlib's graph window will scale inside this window, and the buttons will stay the same on the on the, on the user interface. So the buttons will have the same kind of default size or adapted to the text in the inside and, and the, the rest of the user in favor automatically scale. Okay. 
Um, there should be a video of this. Also, I think it's a good idea to open all your all the source code files, run them yourself. Try try to see what happens if you change anything, um, and go through the, all the kind of source code files just to kind of get a feel for it yourself. Um, and then also get familiarized with the Qt designer. So any questions before we end the session? I know it's a bit much this, so, uh, but we will be available to help you and uh, we can do a shared session if you want. So how do you find different pieces? Uh, it's a, I can show you here. Um, so um, so I, I put all the, all the so there are user interface examples here. Those are the zip file with everything uh, that I did today, uh, and then um, and then also the, the more complicated example. So okay, I don't misunderstand you. The, the question was how do you find the different pieces once you have loaded them? So that's why I so if if you look at the Qt designer on the right side here, you have the object structure. This is a structure you will you will, will get or the objects will be created in Python. So um, for example, this push, push button will be a self.push button. Um, so every, every control will, have a, uh, will be added with the name in Python. I will also put the links to the documentation for PyQt here as well, so you can uh, look at that. Yes, and you can do in, in my uh, UI.zip, there is a lot of UI files you can load and, and uh, look at. And all of these are, uh, you can also load into your user interface and try. And the main file there is forms.py, which is the simplest one. No, you don't have to 15 button names in memory, but it helps when you, you kind of name your things consistently. Uh, Okay, so I see you tomorrow on the exercise. Um, if there is any more, any more questions. Okay then. Thank you very much for today and we'll see you tomorrow then. <laughs>